Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you very much to the Lisbon Council, Juan, and all the friends of the Lisbon Council for inviting me to be here with uh, Tony Giddens, with Lord Giddens. So I'm very happy to share your thoughts with all this uh, audience. I have to say that uh, I uh, fully share 99.9% .9 of uh, what you said about Europe. And this is remarkable being a, a British citizen, <laughs> a member of the House of Lords, to uh, talk about Europe with passion and asking passion to the audience and to the citizens when thinking and when uh, looking at Europe. I'm very happy to do so. The same way uh, I was very happy when you uh, wrote uh, the famous book, The Third Way, and your contributions to what uh, New Labour did in the, in the past uh, years to modernize the uh, center-left and to contribute to a, a closer relationship between uh, the British center-left and the European project. But you mentioned, uh, you started and almost you ended your speech uh, talking about Churchill. And I would like very much to uh, have the opportunity to listen to Winston Churchill today giving a speech as uh, the one he pronounced in uh, Geneva, I think it was uh, this. Uh, Zurich. Uh, Zurich. In Zurich. Because I think that uh, the same passion that uh, Winston Churchill described regarding the European integration in the aftermath of the Second World War would be listened today, but uh, concluding that the UK should be a member of this project and not uh, an observer from outside on how the continental Europe will advance in the integration. A politician, a leader with the vision Churchill had is uh, 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 very desirable in these times where lack of vision, and not only regarding European issues, m many other aspects, but in particular European issues uh, are uh, uh, shown by many of our so-called leaders. I think uh, Europe, the European project, the European integration needs uh, during these years and looking into the future uh, much more vision than the one is demonstrated by our present leaders. And not only a vision from a national perspective, but a common vision as European leaders, because uh, emotion cannot be created uh, without a political vision, without uh, shared values. I don't think emotion can be created by technocratic analysis, of course, Emotion cannot be created uh, by consultants preparing the uh, way the next uh, European uh, Parliament elections will take place. Emotion should be based on real uh, purpose, clear vision, and clear strategies. It's uh, uh, some kind of paradoxical that uh, if you look into the, into the uh, Tony Giddens book, you will uh, see a picture in uh, uh, Kosovo or Albania, I think, where two uh, Albanian uh, citizens are uh, having a coffee in a, in a restaurant or in a bar with uh, one Albanian flag and one European flag. And yesterday, in the uh, TV news, I was watching the demonstration in Kiev of uh, Ukrainian citizens wearing uh, European flags and asking their government, their uh, political uh, responsibles, to be closer to the European Union and to be as much Europeans as possible because they uh, feel that this is the best option for the future. Uh, we have seen yesterday also a big success of uh, the European external action, the agreement on, in Iran is uh, remarkable, the role played by the European Union, in particular by the High Representative, by Cathy Ashton, also Vice President of the Commission. <laughs> but uh, watching the, uh, the Spanish news in the, uh, uh, at the evening yesterday, well, there were, uh, John Kerry was there, uh, some uh, images of John Kerry, some images of Netanyahu, upset because of the result of the agreement, and 
almost an instantaneous uh, uh, shot of uh, of uh, Kathy Aston without a single word, without uh, explaining what she said as the uh, conclusions of these uh, very successful negotiations. So we need uh, emotion, we need vision, and this should be based on clear answers to our main problems uh, today. What are our main problems are very well described in the, in the Tony uh, books. Economic stagnation. An economic stagnation now, there is a debate after the Larry Summers uh, speech uh, during the IMF conference, and Paul Krugman wrote about this in the, in the recent days. Economic stagnation will be with us unless at the EU level we have a real economic strategy. With all my respects, with the Lisbon Council, that took uh, the Lisbon word, because of the Lisbon strategy, we don't have this strategy. We have definition of uh, targets, of objectives, some uh, uh, documents, but when you look at the practical way these uh, uh, rhetoric uh, objectives and strategies are transmitted into decisions, unfortunately, we don't have a real strategy. Still, we need it. I'm convinced that we will have it, but we don't have it. It's very well described in the, in the book, for instance, what happens with the energy policy in Europe, with the absence of an energy single market, and the very serious problems, and not only economic problems, also political problems, strategic problems, that we will uh, have if we don't uh, agree at the highest level possible, a clear energy policy strategy for our future. We have uh, described what the digital agenda is, but with all these uh, technological changes and advances and the way they will change, they, will ch they are changing our life. Still, the digital agenda is at the beginning of the beginning, and we have everyday barriers and difficulties, obstacles to share uh, uh, as Europeans the possibilities and the opportunities of these uh, uh, huge changes in the way uh, our life will develop thanks to the digital uh, era. And hopefully we will have a common purpose in the negotiation of the TTIP, of the Trade uh, and Investment Partnership with the uh, US uh, friends, hopefully. Uh, I think uh, there is a uh, a first step that is extremely important, both in Washington and in Brussels. Uh, but at the same time, <laughs> I hear one day, uh, another day, uh, voices, not some voices that are not supportive of the advancement in the negotiation, but, but are trying to exclude from the negotiation this point or another point, and with uh, uh, facts that have nothing to do with the negotiation that are used as an argument to try to exclude some point or another point in the agenda of these negotiations. We need to be uh, clearly supportive of this uh, partnership agreement with the US and not to uh, be tempted by the nostalgic defensive attitudes. The world will not be uh, the world that existed uh, only 10 or 15 years ago. The world is changing very fast and will continue to change and if we want to get out of this crisis, we will need to promote and to push in favor of more changes. We have opportunities to transform our uh, uh, political will of change into concrete results, to build the Economic and Monetary Union for the next uh, decade or decades. And we are in an ongoing uh, process with difficulties, but at the same time also with advancements. <clears throat> if we look at what is the situation today of the Economic and Monetary Union, and what was the situation in 2007 at the beginning of the crisis, uh, a lot of decisions had been adopted with difficulties, with tensions, but uh, we are going uh, uh, forward, we are not uh, going backwards, but this should be continued. This is not uh, yet finished. Even the Banking Union is in, in the midst of the discussion. And we have, on the other hand, at the level of uh, the member states, uh, the governments and the parliaments in our uh, member states, we have another big opportunity to build the uh, basis for the future, 
discussing the uh, social model, what, what is called the social model, that is a, an abstract uh, concept that needs to be transformed into uh, different uh, concrete realities in a Europe, in a European uh, uh, space that has very, very big di divergences or differences in the level of social protection, of social services, of public services among our different member states. But <clears throat> this is a real task for Europeans that cannot be let only, only in the hands of national governments. Europe should take more ownership on the social conditions of our citizens, on some important decisions that cannot be anymore adopted at the national level, at the member state level. And today, still, we have a very serious imbalance when we have competences to do the difficult things for economic adjustments, uh, reforms, fiscal consolidations, and so on and so forth. But we don't have almost any instruments to uh, build the basis, the architecture of a European social model <clears throat> in a moment when inequalities have increased very, very quickly and in an impressive uh, way. And finally, values. We need to be very active against uh, populism, of course. Europe was a democratic project around democratic values. And now, within Europe, there are voices that are putting into question some of these basic values. We need to be uh, active. We need to protect, to strengthen our democracy. But to strengthen our democracy cannot be done only at the national level. Most of the, our citizens still think at the national level as the owner of our democratic institutions, of our democratic life, of our democratic uh, rights and freedoms. But we need to recognize that it's no more possible to uh, lead this fight for a better and deeper democracy if we don't think in political terms about further political integration in Europe. It's not possible. If we uh, try to reduce our democratic space in our member states, uh, at our member states level, our democracies will weaken. And in some parts of Europe, our democracies are being weakened seriously during these years. Sovereignty plus, the concept that Tony uses in the book is extremely relevant. But the relevance of the member states of the European Union is a question that needs to be discussed uh, at the European level. I, when Churchill pronounced this uh, speech in Zurich, was uh, a period after the Second World War, immediately before the Cold War started. And during all the years of the Cold War, Europe, the European community at the time, the European Union at the end of the Cold War period, was part of the Western uh, area and under the leadership in many areas of the US. Before uh, the Second World War, and even until the 60s, some of the members of, uh, of the European Union were uh, empires, or old empires, or still had colonies that uh, uh, were con preserving some of the uh, relevant instruments of the old empires that disappeared before. Now this world is gone. We have no more, fortunately, no more Cold War. Empires will not come back. Emerging countries have uh, uh, taken a very relevant role in many of, uh, of the issues that are relevant, important at the global level. And any single European country can defend our, its own interests without pushing in favor of more integration. Uh, Giddens uh, says, uh, I, I just uh, came from India, the best way to observe the lack of capacity of a single member state in Europe to be relevant at the global level is to go outside to China or to India or to Brazil or to other parts of the world where the price that we have to pay for the division of Europe in the relationship with these uh, relevant players of the uh, new global world is obvious. 
And this is a, a question that is not only a democratic issue, because uh, if citizens feel that their democratic institutions are not able to solve the problems, to protect their interests, to advance <laughs> initiatives, they will increase the lack of trust they have in national institutions in many of our countries. This is also an economic issue if we don't uh, want to become a stagnation area in the global economy, the last ones in the growth rates when the IMF or the uh, other multi multilateral institutions publish uh, GDP figures, we need to be more relevant at the global level. We need to be more integrated. This is, uh, these are rational arguments. These are not emotional. How we can add to this rationality of the European integration project the emotion that uh, Tony Giddens uh, asks? Well, I think it's a, it's a question not to be solved. It's not possible to solve this question of emotion here in Brussels, within these big buildings, in this area around Rompuy Schuman or the parliament in Rivellier. This is not possible. Emotion regarding Europe should be born at the national level with national uh, debates, with the priorities set up by national institutions, by democratic governments elected in all of our member states, that once they have established their own priorities, their own ambitions, their own uh, future, they will need to be here discussing and putting in common the respective uh, uh, promises to their citizens of the respective strategies to improve the uh, uh, revenues and the welfare levels of their citizens. I don't think that the origin of emotion lies in Berlemont or in Charlemagne or in Justo Lipsius or in any of these buildings. These buildings should receive once a week or once a, every two weeks or once a month or once every three months, <coughs> national leaders that will bring here the emotion and will come here to transform this emotion into policies, strategies, and decisions. And the, the only ones in Brussels that uh, should help the Commission to attract these emotions that has an origin at the national level are indeed the members of the European Parliament. Probably the European Parliament as such is still too young, is powerful, but too young to be the origin of the emotions, but the European Parliament should be the link between national emotions and the Brussels life. This is the reason why I think there are extremely important elections in May 2014, because of the composition of the Parliament, and I I'm not resigned to see a parliament dominated or controlled by populist or by racist or by xenophobic people. I think we have time and political will to bring here a parliament with a huge majority of democratic forces and pro-European forces. But uh, at the same time, this cannot be done only by the candidates in the list of the different parties, uh, pro-European families, in the European election. This will require the whole, uh, whole support and the full support of the uh, political families when discussing in the respective member states the uh, national priorities and when intervening in the national debate. If, and I conclude with this, if every European Council will conclude with the members, the head of the state and government of the 28, going down to the uh, lower floor in the Just Tbilisius, in the council uh, building, to tell their media, their national media, that they won and that the others gave up, this will not make possible an emotional Europe. This is not a vision for Europe. Thank you.